Good morning, friends. Hey, there we go. It's good to see you in person and online. My name is Pastor Scott Bonds, your associate pastor, and it's good to be with you here in this place or online today for worship. No matter where you find yourself here or at home, I want to encourage you to take some time today to fill out a Connect card, you, whether you got one in person or online or want to scan that QR code on your way out of the building. It just lets us know again that you were here, but it's also a way for you to find out more information, some things that you can check and mark and raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to know more about this or opportunities but also a way for you to share joys and concerns, whether with the staff at large or just with Pastor Karen and myself, um, and you might have something to share. And so please take some time to do that today. Got a handful of announcements this morning that I want to to lift up. Uh, The first is I wanna say a huge, huge, huge thank you to each and every one of you for all of the ways in which you gave to Sammy's Window in the month of July. Uh, Sammy's Window, you'll remember, is an agency through Foster Adopt Connect that helps resource and support foster and adoptive families all over the spectrum with things like clothes and hygiene items and food and, uh, and all kinds of things. Together, we were able to, to collect and, and deliver hundreds of pounds of supplies, over $700 in, uh, in donations, in cash donations, as well as uh, many, many gift cards to support their work. Um, so without you, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Without you, Foster and Adopt Connect and Sammy's Window um, wouldn't be able to help foster and adoptive families. I do want to turn your attention to think about the month of August. Um, And uh, August means back to school, right? Um, For those of you with little kiddos or grandkids and and all of that, thinking about that, um, that oftentimes is a time of a lot of expenses for families. You've got to buy new clothes, you've got to buy school supplies and school fees and sports equipment and all of those kind of things. So in the month of August, we are going to receive um, we are going to receive school supplies for many of our partner agencies here in Springfield for schools and places like Sammy's Windows that uh, Sammy's Window that helps families. So the month of August, there'll be collection bins at both entrances again to collect school supplies. So be watching. We'll have a list of items needed uh, to support uh, our partners in our community. We have lots of opportunities. You've read and heard about the pop-up book clubs and things like that. Um, But as we think about discipleship here at Kingsway, we don't just think about the spirit. We also think about the the body and the mind. Um, So I want to draw your attention to other opportunities to to connect and and, uh, to be uh, to commune with other people. We have lots of support groups here at Kingsway, whether Alzheimer's support groups, grief, you know, care and sharing, those kind of groups. We also have um, an exercise group that meets throughout the week uh, every day in the morning, and they would love for you to be a part of that. You can find more information on the screen. Um, We have also AA and Al-Anon that meet here at Kingsway. So, you know, we, we think of discipleship holistically, right? not just the spirit, but also the body and the mind. So you can always go to our website to find out more about that, uh, to find out how you might connect and join a group. Last and definitely not least, uh, anybody know what is happening Wednesday? It's behind me on the screen. Outdoor worship, outdoor worship. Uh, I give you the answers to the quiz, friends. Uh, outdoor worship at the in, uh, in timing with the, the end of VBS, uh, we will have outdoor worship on Wednesday from 7 to 8. Um, it's going to be a good time, blended service, a little bit of everything for everyone. Uh, and if just the idea of being and having another opportunity to worship was not enough, uh, would it help if I bribed you with snow nuts, snow cones or donuts? Look, if you want me to say yes to something, friends, invite me to free food, right? Uh, so we're, we're not above bribing you to come and enjoy us in worship on the 28th from 7 to 8, so a good time um, to, to do those kind of things, but we will have refreshments afterwards. Plus, you get to see the kids sing and, and learn all about what happened in VBS and learn about the armor of God, but I'm going to let Stephanie tell you more about that here in a minute. As we think about worship, uh, I want to uh, just turn your attention to the screens 
as you uh, watch a video with Pastor Karen and myself and friends about worship this fall. Hello friends, by now you have probably heard our announcement about the changes coming to Kingsway in worship at the end of August. And I brought Pastor Scott along today to talk a little bit more about that. Hey friends, so excited to be here with you and I hope you're as excited as I am about what we've heard about worship uh, coming up this fall. Uh, you may be wondering why, why some of these changes, how they all fit together. Uh, you know that our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Pastor Karen has consistently talked about this is important for us uh, and that we need to expand that. And we continue to, to look as discipleship team on what does it mean um, for us to do discipleship. We try to listen uh, as best as we can to what you have to say about what works and what you need and your rhythms of life. Uh, and so we have been trying and continue to try uh, to expand discipleship in such a way that we provide spaces for not just new people, people who aren't engaged in discipleship or small groups or Sunday schools and, and life groups, whatever language you maybe have used historically, uh, but also to prioritize and centralize some new discipleship opportunities for households with school-aged children. We're looking at that as a team, but we also as children and youth uh, and others are engaged in discipleship, we want to provide opportunities for you as parents and for others, our college-age students, um, to do these things. And it's just incredibly important um, to be able to create a structure and a system to do that. I hope that you will be thinking about worship with Kingsway, beginning with a traditional service at 9 a.m. on Sundays and a contemporary service at 10.30 with discipleship opportunities around it. I also think about how it gives us opportunity for everyone to be involved as a volunteer and in discipleship throughout the week as we move to this new schedule. Listen now as others share about their excitement for this new schedule. My name is Sarah Collins and I am a navigator here at Kingsway. I am so excited about the new discipleship hour mainly because this is going to give my family an opportunity to expand in our own discipleship where we can all come together and all be here and all have the time and opportunity to really grow our relationship with Christ, not just for my children, but for my husband and I as well. I'm looking forward to just being able to not only worship in the worship hour on Sunday, but have a place to go we can be around other families our own age and really have a community and support group to be together and just follow on this journey together. Friends, please stand for our call to worship. This is my comfort in my distress, that your promise gives me life. Let us pray. We come to worship you, God, and we long for comfort. In your arms this morning, can our distress subside? In the name of Jesus, you hold us as your children, and you promise us life, life eternal, life with you. May these promises guide our thoughts and our prayers this morning. Amen. I'll invite those of you who are able to remain standing and we'll sing together our opening hymn. It's hymn 98, To God Be the Glory. Again, hymn 98. Praise 
I'm Stephanie McCormick, the Director of Children's Ministries. And how many of you have been to a, ball, a baseball game? And I'm sure you can think about all the protective gear that the baseball players wear. Well, one in particular is the catcher. And if you think about the catcher, he has many different items on to protect himself. One, he has the mask to protect his face. He has the glove to catch the fastballs that come through. He has the chest protection to protect all of his vital organs. And of course, he has the shin guards as well. Well, the Bible teaches us that we need protection also. The Bible calls this the armor of God. And it protects us from all of Satan's evil plans to hurt us. Well, what kind of protection does the Bible say we need? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. The Bible says that we need the belt of truth. And it tells us that God's enemy, Satan, is the father of all lies. But Satan can never win as long as we know the truth that Jesus is Lord. The next plate piece that we have is the breastplate of righteousness. And Satan can never harm us when we choose to do what God says is right. Our next piece, they're kind of weird looking, but these are the shoes of peace. And our feet are fitted with these because Satan tries to give us worry and confusion. But knowing Jesus brings us peace. The next one is the shield of faith. And Satan tries to plant seeds of doubt in our hearts and minds. But those seeds of doubt can never take root as long as we know Jesus is king. The next one is the helmet of salvation. Jesus came from heaven to earth to save us from the evil one. If we choose to follow Jesus, we will win our fight against evil. And the last one is our sword of truth and spirit. So the Bible, God's holy word, is a powerful weapon against Satan. So just as a catcher needs protection because of the place that he is in the ball game, 
Christians need all the protection that God has given us. So remember, Satan cannot harm us when we put on the full armor of God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the protection that you have given us against the evils of this world and Satan's plans to harm us. Help us to always remember to put on every piece of your armor. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, I don't know if all of you know or not, but the reason that we're talking about the armor of truth today, or the armor of God, is because tonight, after many months of planning, we are starting our vacation Bible school. And I want you to join me now so that you can get just a taste of how this week is going to go. Sparky! 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 Where are you? What am I going to do and you ask about that silly dragon? Where is that dragon? I need her for VBS. Sparky! Sparky! There you are! I've been looking for you. VBS is getting ready to start and the kids are going to be here. Oh boy, I can't wait. Let me go tell them night. What? Uh, wait! Sparky! Something to look forward to. Greetings, I am Pastor Karen Hayden. I return with Thanksgiving after a few weeks of renewal and vacation with my family. It is good to be in worship with all of you, whether you are a guest in our community today or are returning to be encouraged by being in the mix of our company. Before we pray our prayer today, our community prayer, I remind you that we have been studying the pastor, the Lord's Prayer for the past six weeks. But that's not really true, is it? It's not technically accurate, as my child might say. Every week we study the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a constant. If there is any constant in our worship services, every week the Lord's Prayer has its place. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught us this prayer. It gives us instruction. As one author says, it is an instruction on how to bend our lives toward God. The praying of a prayer is a journey. It becomes a trip to trust Jesus. We commit this prayer to heart. We need to keep practicing it. Some people say we memorize it and it becomes rote and stale. I'd say it's a good thing if it becomes second nature because it isn't just about memorizing, but it becoming habit. And we need some good habits in our lives. Jesus taught us and we teach this prayer to be reminded of God's acts among us. You may have read this week in our weekly update Sidebar, if you do not get the Friday weekly email updates and want to receive them, reach out to our office. But this week I shared that one of my children reminded me of the hour in our Father of this prayer. Somewhere, I don't know, mile 1562, I don't know, I was mentally preparing for this sermon and I was saying the Lord's Prayer aloud and asked my youngest two what I was missing. One responded, oh, that's the prayer we learned at Kingsway. How moving. For my children, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples that has been handed down to all Christians, even and especially those in formation at Kingsway United Methodist Church, is considered Kingsway's prayer. Of course, I share that it is bigger than us, but also gave thanks that they recognize this as something we pray together. Throughout this sermon series, we have talked about the plural R as it acknowledges the presence of God and our connection and community together. 
When we pray this prayer, Our Father, we know that we are not alone. But when we pray, Our Father, we know that we are in community together, praying with a purpose. So we pause to pray now, and we end our time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Today, we hold some people that acknowledge that they are at the end of life, that have filled this place with their prayers. We lift them to God this morning. We pray they know God's peace and promises this day. We give thanks for precious newborns and children in our midst that we get the privilege to teach this prayer. We celebrate a wedding that we had yesterday and what it means for us to be together to pray on their behalf. We pray for those who don't have a connection in faith. We pray for the hungry. We pray for those who are seeking work. We pray for those who have openings and where people are looking for work that they may look at their openings and, and name if their benefits and wages make for a whole life. We pray for medical procedures, those upcoming. We pray for our community in the midst of a pandemic and how our actions affect one another. We pray that we lead with care. We pray for our country. We consider our resources and what it means to be a people who hold influence and responsibility. In this season of the Olympics, I like to say that I celebrate we're able to play together in peace. The games paint a picture of a better future. And don't we say that's why we pray? To connect with God's dreams for a future? We name that we depend on God for direction and strength. And today we call upon a God who saves as we pray together. Were these concerns and joys that we have named aloud, O oh God, we give thanks that you hear our prayer. our ongoing prayer. We thank you for your love and your life. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I just want to remind us of the purple slips of paper that are found out before you come inside to the sanctuary. I thought those slips of paper were going to be a May experience where we wrote down our prayers and put them in the wall of the church. But somebody and some of you told me that we could keep doing this. So we keep these slips of paper out that we might continue to leave our prayers for this church and the world in our walls. That they become a part of our foundation, literally and figuratively. It was cool last, yesterday afternoon to, to see people looking at those slips of paper as they were guests in our church for the wedding. And they remind us that we can offer God our deepest need. Amen.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the gift of scripture, thanks be to God. Deliver us from evil. We basically end this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, by calling on the one who saves to be there for us. We pray for God to be with us again. Deliver us from evil, from whatever form it may present itself. We cry out at the end of the prayer that we need God. Once again, we name our dependence upon the giver of life. I don't know where you come in this sixth week of a study of a short passage of the Bible and our reflection of the prayer Jesus taught us in Matthew 6. But I will tell you that we have been on a journey. The three of us who have shared the preaching, and thank you brothers, by the way, appreciate your work and your intentions. But we might tell you that there are at least six more weeks that we could pray on the Lord's Prayer. I know that I have found more than one week's worth of a sermon for today's verse. Have no fear, it's just one sermon today. But my point is, we are not finished with the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps we are just getting started on our journey to know God. Because this prayer is the enactment of the story of God who called people into existence, our Creator, and redeemed us through Jesus Christ. So who better to teach us this prayer than Jesus himself? But before we get to the prayer, I'm going to tell you a story. A story of God's making. A story that comes from the Old Testament. A redemption story that Jesus might tell you if you ask him, tell me a story about God's faithfulness. From the book of Exodus, where God names his people and his work on their behalf through the servant Moses. For those who may not know, or for those who have forgotten, Moses is a giant in our story. But we remember he didn't appear that way in the beginning, did he? He was, shall I say, reluctant, hesitant, unsure, until he came to terms with the Redeemer in his midst. The Lord said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Because of the cry of my people has reached me, and I have seen the way you are oppressed, I want you to go. I'm sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God said, I will be with you. 
But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So God gave Moses some instruction for the people and Moses. In the midst of it, God said, I will be there and I will act too. Just watch. For those familiar with this story, it may not have gone exactly as you would expect. Moses went to the Pharaoh king and the king, well, he offered more hardship than relief. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on your people? Is this why you sent me? Even when I went to the Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought us more trouble, and you haven't rescued your people at all. Have you gone to God with such a line like that before? I think it's healthy. We're keeping check on who's in control and who isn't, right? When I name that, I'm naming, God, I have an expectation of you. And if we believe God is the one who saves, we are to call on God. God's response to, you haven't rescued your people at all, the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do with the Pharaoh. Because of the mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of the country. God also said, I am the Lord. And I remember my covenant. And I will bring you to the land I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Oh, good. Right? Not so fast. Moses reported this to the Israelites, and the Egyptians didn't listen. They were in dire circumstances. And so, for the Israelites, it's hard to listen when your workload is doubled and your reward isn't coming. Then the Lord said to Moses, Do as I instruct, and you will see signs and wonder multiplied. The issue, I think, was the timing. Perhaps it didn't come as swiftly as they hoped. For Scripture says the people had been in captivity 430 years before their release. But I'll bring you to the finish of the story. God heard their cries. God intervened, and after some stubborn resistance, plagues, and a lot of loss, the king finally says what? Go, get out of here. He releases them, but they're not far out of town before he realizes, wait, (laughs) I just sent all my laborers, uh, so army, let's go follow them. And that's where God showed up again and showed God's promise. God went before him, before them, And when it looked like they were trapped, Moses said to his people, Don't be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to stand still. Moses raised his hand. God's people were able to cross the sea and made it to safety. And the pursuers... They did not make it. My point for today is when the mighty hand of the Lord was displayed, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. When the people saw, when the people remembered the mighty hand of God, they put their trust in him. So Exodus 3 reveals an essential feature of the character of God for us even today. God is moved by human suffering. God acts within human history and enters into our experience to alleviate suffering. 
The account of Moses portrays God as one who has a relationship with a particular people, Israel. And our relationship with Jesus brings us into that people. God works for us and through us to bring justice to the world. So, generations later, Jesus is reminding people of God's steadfastness when he teaches our Father who art in heaven. Jesus told those who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we submit ourselves to following the way. We know truth by coming to know Jesus and we know this person by praying the way he taught us to pray. So if you came today to hear what I call evil or evil ones or the evil one, I really want to say I don't know if we need any more descriptors. We know what brings us down. Perhaps today we need a reminder of the one who brings us up, the one who redeems us, that God is the one who saves. Today in this prayer, as we ask for deliverance, we acknowledge that we need help. And we need help even when we don't know we need help, especially when we don't know that we need help. In praying this prayer and this line about deliverance, we acknowledge that God is greater than any foe of God. In our prayer today, Jesus' point is God can be trusted. And there are more stories than the ones I just told you. Maybe God doesn't always intervene like he did on behalf of the slaves in the exodus of the Old Testament, but the Gospels, basically the story of Jesus' life, are another reminder of God's redemptive acts. Jesus reminds us in the prayer that God be, can be trusted and is actively engaging on behalf of those in bondage. And there are stories that come after the Gospels. There are stories that you know, that you have experienced where God saves. How do you remember those stories? How do you tell other people of those stories? Because maybe our problem in our not seeing divine interventions is not that they don't happen, but we are blind to their occurrence or we are unfaithful in telling of them. Will Willimon put it this way, if you're conditioned to think through the years of schooling, as well as by living in a secular culture, that there is a non-God explanation for everything that happens in the world, then that's the world you see. Maybe we ought to doubt our faith in an inactive, detached, and unconcerned God. Do you need a moment with that one? When the Hebrews stood on the shore of the sea and realized that they were free, that the Egyptians would not get them because the army was no more, they, not, they said not only, now we believe in Moses and Moses and God, they also implied we were wrong when we said God does not care about us, that God's inactive, now we know the truth. Perhaps amidst our natural doubts, Exodus tells the dramatic account of deliverance in order to enable us to doubt our doubts. God has acted to deliver in the past and God will do it again. If you doubt that there is a God, 
and that this God is actively intervening on the side of the oppressed to punish the oppressor and deliver the oppressed. Keep looking over your shoulder. Keep looking ahead. Because as God dramatically acted in Exodus, God will do it again. And so we gather together and we pray, us. Yeah, us. The people that see oppression and evil, scary things around us every day. In our weakness, in our weakness, we gather together to pray and ask for deliverance. Deliver us from evil. We pray to the one who would not abandon his people. Through the Bible, and through this prayer, we remember God didn't just come into the world to create a people and walk off, leaving us to our own devices. God intruded. And through the cross of Jesus, God made clear that his purposes for creation would not be defeated. So I leave you these words from another follower of the way who came after Jesus a disciple, apostle, Paul, who speak to God's promises in the face of fear. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justified. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we pray. Amen. As people bound up in this story, we have life, and we celebrate that new life when we come together and when we pray and and when we offer our gifts back to God with assurance that gifts that we give will be multiplied and that we will receive what we need. I invite you to consider in this moment the gifts that God has given you and through the week how it is that you might share those gifts with others in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite those of you who are able to remain standing and sing our final hymn, Hymn 555, Forward Through the Ages. Again, Hymn 555. delivers. Know that as you go into this week that you are not alone, that you are equipped by the one who created you, redeemed you, and sustained you. Amen. Amen.